I want to say some things about uh, site analysis and how, how, what an important part of the design process that is. I mean, it really is designing. Um, it's not really separate to me. Um, and I think kind of how we see a site is such a huge part of how we respond to it, so how we represent it to ourselves. Um, does, can someone tell me what this is? There's some hints and words in there, but. <laughs> so it's not actually the watershed, it's not a map of the watershed, although you might be able to see things about the watershed. What do you think it's representing? I think it's soils and geology. Soils and geology, yes. Um, so I think you know it's just a reading of this area, and you can obviously see the way that the land has been formed um, through waterways as well as other geological forces over time. Um, but that's you know you're you're seeing the Ventura River here, and then the Santa Clarita River here. Um, so we were just talking actually about this. I just wanted to bring up Los Angeles because. We are such a unique watershed here in Ojai right now. Um, you know, we may decide to hook up to state water. That might be part of our source. But at the moment, we our source is what falls here um, on the ground and what gets stored in the ground and what we use. Um, whereas, you know, in Los Angeles, um, the actual watershed of LA is much larger than the LA River watershed. Right? It's it's they're drawing water from um, all these other ecosystems and you know the impact of that the way that water connects us to other places is pretty powerful so you know the impact of using water in LA is incredibly disconnected from these other ecosystems and and so I think we kind of have this unique ability in Ojai to be able to demonstrate a different way of building a city, a different way of kind of living in a city. Um, and, you know, the other kind of climate change component to this that maybe everyone's familiar with is that, you know, even if we get a lot of rain, like we have been getting, um, the looking at snowpack and where sn and how much we rely on snow melt to kind of give a steady supply of water to all these cities in Southern California, that's going to be shifting. And LA right now is scrambling to figure out how to, how to deal with that. Um, and of course, there's also an incredible amount of water in an urbanized area that's just being sent out to the ocean. We're fortunate here that we're not quite so heavily urbanized, um, but I think you know the way that we kind of design the spaces we live in interacts with the water around us in such a tangible and incredible way. I just I just wanted to bring up that um, you know as we think about Ojai for a model, we we nearby have a very different model for comparison, and I think that actually kind of makes Ojai an even more powerful place. Um, this is where my obsession with water began um, in the Upper Valley, the creek I grew up on here. And I think, you know, this interest in water is the interconnectedness that it brings to, um, to our lives, our daily experience with these very large systems and with other species um, and ecosystems. It's such a tangible connection between everything that, you know, that was a huge part of why I wanted to work with water through design. I think in my own teaching and practice, um, I just wanted to be, you know, kind of straightforward about my objectives, like why, again, why water is important. And then um, my interest in design is really about how do we design for creating shared narratives of resilience, um, which I think there's a really an opportunity for here at this garden. Um, and also, how do we, you know, not just get overwhelmed by these vast issues um, and challenges of climate change, but find ways to um, impact those things in our daily practices and in our daily lives. And then also that there's just kind of the beautiful enjoyment of that we want to be living in places that really engage our senses um, and connect us to place, and that that's you know, an important part of everything. In talking about site analysis, um, I mean, in a lot of the work I do, it's very, it's bigger scale kinds of site anal analysis, but I think the same kinds of issues apply whether you are looking at your backyard or you're looking at a city or a whole region. 
um, where you really want to be considering what kind of forces and layers are at play and what relationships are there in the land. Um, I just had to bring up Ian McCarg because I think Designing with Nature, his book, has influenced um, you know, landscape architects, engineers, designers, and really kind of, even though this was before computers and GIS, it, it proposed a whole way of looking at the layers of a landscape and starting to analyze, you know, what's appropriate where? Where do we actually, where does it make sense to urbanize and where do we want to allow room for river corridors and riparian habitat? Um, and, you know, what's kind of prime agricultural land? So it's just this reading of the multiple, um, again, like layers that go into a place so that we can actually understand um, a larger vision for what makes sense in that space. So, um, you know, ideally with any site, you want to be actually looking at the um, rainfall, the topography, the vegetation. Um, so there's a lot of that that we can do just through our experience in a smaller site like this. And then there's a lot of that that when you're able to actually gather that information and look at um, is really powerful to do. But of course, you know, that's something that in some cases you, you need technical support for. Um, I'm just showing this image. This is a st student work um, where I'm asking students to look at the layered morphology of the Central Valley. And again, it's about understanding what forces went into shaping that place so that when they actually get down to the scale of a site, there's this larger understanding of um, the river networks and the soil types. And um, you know, in the Central Valley, for example, if you're really looking at the scale of geological time, you are thinking about that that was an inland sea. And then over time, mountains eroded and filled in hundreds of feet, I mean, it's about 200 feet deep of aquifers. I mean, I think kind of thinking through the process of how a land formed is helpful for us, just, you know, even here in the valley, understanding that that larger time scale we're just kind of at the edge of, and that that did form a landscape that if we understand, we can design for in better ways. So we do have aquifers that can be recharged here that we've been depleting. Um, you know, everything, all of these issues that are much more extreme in places like the Central Valley or Los Angeles are here. They're just in less extreme ways um, and a little bit more manageable, which is exciting. Um, so again, just, you know, kind of both the, the hidden layers that we don't see but that are impacting the surface um, and how we start to visualize those. And then... Um, I just wanted to introduce that, uh, you know, anytime you're recording information about a site, you're using some kind of notation system. So even if that's words, that's a notation system. Um, you know, when we play music, there's a notation system for that, right? Or there's scores. Um, so in recording a site, it's helpful to think about what kinds of notation you want to use for different types of information. Um, and so we're going to do, after, after some observational analysis um, with art, we're also going to have um, plans of the site and, and just ask you to walk through the site and notate a few types of information. Um, so I, 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 again, just referencing kind of some important thinkers, Lawrence and Anna Halperin. So Lawrence Halperin was a landscape architect. His wife, Anna, is a um, choreographer. And so I think that kind of synergy of thinking about how you move through a space and experience it is part of how you should design it. So we've been talking a lot about you know tools and quantities of water to save and all of these very important things, but there's also just designing for the experience as you walk through a site and how that ties into you know whatever kind of um, demonstration you want to create or just experience you want to have. So again, some student work. Um, and in this case, you know, often what I'll ask students to do is to um, ha record a couple kinds of information. So some of that information being um, can be 
qualitative and some of that can be quantitative. So meaning, you know, we might record information about how much rain falls on this roof and what can we do with it. And we might record information about, you know, what kinds of soils and what, what are their infiltration rate to know if we can put water in the ground. But then there's also the qualitative information. Um, and I think bringing those two together when designing is really important. So in this case, the student took a lot of photographs and recorded things about a trail that she was walking, but then also recorded um, you know, whether she was hot or cold or what kind of views she had. And we're going to be doing kind of a, a simple version of that today. So um, if we think of this site, well, I'd like you to, to invite you to think about the community garden as a bit of a microcosm of the watershed or the Ojai Valley, because we do have a lot of ecotones on this site. I mean, if we think of these buildings as being sort of like mountains where you can uh, that get rained on and that water either flows down the hillside, um, possibly eroding things or maybe being directed in good ways um, towards the creek. And then we, we, you know, on this site have a unique situation where we do have the riparian edge along the creek. And so we have the wetter places and the drier places and places where different kinds of plants like to grow and the shadier places. And, um, you know, of course, there's, there's a lot that you could study just about what plants should go where, um, what kind of soils are here. But I think we today can just kind of go through um, walking a path. So I, if everyone can choose a path that they would like to take, um, and again, we'll do some observational analysis with art before you do this, but you'll take the plans and walk a path through the site that you feel comfortable walking. So it can be longer, shorter, um, and take some time to really observe um, and I'd, I'd like to ask that you observe at least three things. So pick one, at least one sense. So that could be smell or what kind of views you have. And have a simple notation for, you know, is that um, view small or extensive? Or, you know, if it's smell, you might have a different kind of notation for if it's intense or just a very light smell. Um, if it's wind, you could you know, also be recording that. And then, so, so one thing is a sense. Another thing would be to observe some element. So how water moves through the site, and if you can see traces of that. Or you could focus on light, sunshine, you know, what places are getting a lot of light or a little bit of light. Um, and then the third thing is just noticing the kind of spaces that become outdoor rooms where people might collect and gather and the spaces that are more about moving through or being still on your own. So um, so I, I hope that's not too much. You certainly can take on more, but I just wanted to give an example of a, of a few things to record. And I think it would be pretty amazing if people took some different paths and um, created, you know, a very simple notation system, very simple marks, but for recording these experiences along your path. And then, um, you know, we, we will actually collect all of these and kind of look at them synthesized together. I don't know how much time we'll have to do that today, but if not today, they will go into um, future work on the garden. Um, so that's the exercise. And Again, just talking about um, representation and you know why why we do site analysis. Um, I wanted to just show show a few maps of the area to think about you know the very different kinds of stories we tell ourselves about a place depending on how we represent it. So you know one story about this place might look like this. Another story looks very different, and it gives us different kind of information to respond to, and therefore, you know, what we create in that place would be very different. Um, obviously, you know, because sometimes I think there's this sense of, oh, it's a map. It's a map of what's there. But it's never a map of what's there. It's always a map of whatever information we decide to put on that map. And so just to be very conscious of that, that, you know, we could draw a map of 
Ojai that's all about what it feels like to walk around and, you know, what the ground textures are. And that would be very different than a map of Ojai that, you know, is streets and buildings. Um, or a map of Ojai, like you saw earlier, that's all about where are the gray water opportunities and how much could we collect um, gives us different information to respond to. Um, so I just, yeah, I just wanted to pull a few of these to think through that. Um, and we can come back after we do some analysis to talk a little bit about site design and designing for um, extremes and think through that. Um, but I just was going to leave you with, you know, kind of one, one site design we worked on for a rain garden. And in this case, again, um, you know, thinking about not only what's above ground, but also what's below ground and how water is moving through that space and how the roof interacts with the plants, the soils, and the water and, you know, becomes this kind of microcosm of a smaller water cycle happening on a site. Um, so are there any questions about the site analysis before we go through some observation? I think the observational exercise that Art takes us through will kind of help inform then the site analysis and drawing on these actual plans that we have for you at the back. Um, yeah. Mm. Of the garden. And one of the things that I said, well, where was the maintenance plan? Mm -hmm. Because whenever you're thinking about anything, you have to think, how's it going to be maintained? Mm -hmm. And where's the dollars, the value in that? And I think when we go out there, I think that's something to keep in mind that in the early 90s, there was great enthusiasm to design this garden. And then over time, the monies, the enthusiasm, we went by the wayside and we have what we have. Mm -hmm. So interesting, and I yeah, I think that's very important. Is there any way that for you that connects to doing site analysis? Is there something you would want to look at? Yeah, so what would you want to look at? First of all, you're going to see um, deterioration just in the water system itself. Mm -hmm. So, so you're, you're going to analyze that. Was it natural? Was it nature that came in? Because you're going to have a lot of gophers there that are going to be doing things. So you're going to have to work with the population of the wildlife that's going to come so you pointed out how to make some natural water and how things go. Mm -hmm. there's, um, there's some cement ponds there that were part of the original thing. Can you utilize what's there? Do you have to take that out? I think you can begin to see how it was used as a home, a yard, and then it transformed to a demo garden. Do we want to take it back to its most natural, you know, most natural, as you say, the, you know, the, the, the whole environment? Right. So, so in a sense, I mean, it comes back to if you want to have less maintenance on a site, right. if we can actually design with an understanding of the systems that are operating on the site, whether that be water, animals, um, and, and actually observe those things and design with them, then we're going to have less maintenance to do long term, I think is what I'm hearing you yeah. say. Yeah. So, so I think that then, yeah, would make sense to inform some of your site analysis. And then there's the other thing that's a corridor, you know, that it's bigger than it looks. And yet I think you should have some of the right. parameters around that. It goes down to the creek road. It, it could continue on to one of the bike paths or whatever. Uh -huh. So there's some bigger picture. Yeah, I think in terms of really designing the garden, we won't try to deal with all those issues today, but we want to kind of introduce some site analysis and then thinking through how we respond to that and start to think about how to implement some of the tools we brought up. But, I mean, all of this, of course, it's ongoing, and so there's going to be, you know, uh, Tara is going to be organizing many meetings around designing the garden, and so a lot of those more practical issues can come in at that point of, um, you know, what are our site boundaries and what kind of maintenance funds are going to be available. But today, if we can focus on um, get, doing some initial site analysis and thinking about kind of all the tools that were presented earlier, 